I am joined by Dr. Alfred Kithon Hardy. Alfred Kithon, Dr. Kithon Hardy is the research director at the Oxford India Center for Sustainable Development. He's in India right now for a sustainability dialogue that has been recently concluded. And uh, he has been kind enough to join us for an interview. Dr. Hardy, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's very good to be here. I'll keep this interview very brief. Uh, but I'd like to focus on a few specific questions related to the role of markets in uh, addressing climate change and sustainability. Now, uh, looking at the free market system in India uh, per se and in uh, developing economies, you know, sustainability is not treated as a tangible item. So let's say if a person who wants to invest in the renewable energy sector goes to a bank for loan, the bank would be more interested in how much revenue that company is generating through carbon credit schemes other than other sustainability in initiatives that are being undertaken by the company. And uh, these sustainability initiatives are treated as externalities. So in this context, what is the possible recourse to counter this trend, to counter this mindset and what can the government do to pitch in to change this mindset? That's a really interesting question. And I think you limited it to India and developing countries, but it is the same anywhere. So if I go to a bank in the UK, if I go to a bank in the US with a brilliant idea that will generate large measures of sustainability locally, the bank is only interested in that if I can capitalise on it and I can guarantee and I can give them revenue on the loan they give to me. So, so I don't think this is an issue that is limited to India or other developing countries. And this is really, it's a classic example of, of externalities, as you said. And the government's role really is to, one of the key government roles of government is to internalise externalities or provide systems which can do this. So you gave an example yourself of how the bank may be willing to look at the carbon markets. And the carbon market is a form of sustainability market. And there's no reason why this kind of market can't be extended to other goods. So we can have a water market, we can have a clean water market, which is a more interesting aspect. But also, we can have, we can have systems put in place by government to provide um, revenue if you achieve certain other sustainability goals. There are restrictions, there are kind of problems with this, is that you might start to over incentivize certain goals at the expense of others. Um, and also sometimes these can be manipulated. But I think this is an example where markets alone cannot be deemed to provide the solution. There are, of course, some areas where markets can provide a solution for this. So if consumers are sufficiently interested, are sufficiently aware about the issues, they may be willing to pay more for a product from a company which does include sustainability of its processes within its advertising, within its portfolio. Um, but this is much harder to actually to get revenue from. If you ask any consumer, they tend to say, that they would buy the green product. In reality, we can see from looking at what people do actually buy, they often buy the cheapest. Um, so, so it's a really interesting point about where sustainability and the markets don't necessarily overlap. Moving on to the second question, uh, from the government uh, perspective, and particularly from a developing economy perspective, you take countries like China and India. Now, as, as you are aware, that uh, both China and India have made commitments to significant, uh, significantly reduce their carbon emissions by 2020 and 2025, respectively. Now, uh, Arvind Subramaniam and Aditya Mantra, two economists from the World Bank, they came up with a book called Green Print. And in that, they have argued that a 30% emissions reduction by 2020 for India and China would mean a decline in the manufacturing output of 6 to 7 percent. Now, this obviously does not augur well for a growth-oriented developing economy such as India and China. So what can be done to allay this fear? So th this trade-off is eternally brought up and do we want the environment or do we want sustainability? And of course I would argue that there doesn't have to be a trade-off. But I would also not say that there is never a trade-off, that there will be some type of trade-off. Sometimes we will want to go for long-term environmental sustainability at the expense of short-term jobs, short-term profit. 
In terms of the specific figures you raised, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with those figures or where they come from. But one thing I would say is that we're very good at underestimating the initiative, underestimating the imagination of people, and that when we put in frameworks in place, people can be incredibly good at working with those and actually developing systems around them. And we see that throughout the world, and in the developing world especially, where somewhere like India, famous for its ability to, to make do, for its ability to find solutions where they may not otherwise be seen. If we have a fairly consistent and consistently managed and regulated policy put in place, I'd be very surprised if the market and India's ingenuity did not come up with ways of working within that and still managing to grow in a greener way. I think we mustn't underestimate the ability of innovation at every level of India. I'm not just talking for the big companies, I'm talking for people right at the bottom. The informal economy which dominates India's economy, dominates India's employment, and still is probably over half of India's GDP. You see enormous amounts of, in of innovation going on in the informal economy. Um, and slightly off subject, I think that we must make sure when we're looking at such as industry growth, we mustn't just look at the big sectors. We must look at what India's economy actually is at the moment and how that will respond, rather than just focusing on the kind of static view of how um, the major organisations may be working. I'm not giving reflection on this specific book that you referred to, I'm afraid I don't know the details of that. Um, but, and the final thing I'd like to say is that if we look at regulation in the past, we often find that there's an overestimate of the cost on the industry and an underestimate on the actual reality. So I think if we look at many examples in the past, we can find that strong, clear legislation, when it's put in and enforced, tends to have, um, or can have, much lower impacts than we fear. But it's really key to make sure that policy is put in place and is enforced universally and equally, so that companies know what the policy is, how long it's going to be there, and they're then playing on a level playing field with each other. What do you think uh, is the prospect of investing in new technologies in India and China. I refer to these two countries because in the developing world they are the largest emitters of carbon. What do you think are, are the possibilities of investing in new technologies such as carbon capture and carbon storage in, in these countries and will they actually address this problem of uh, manufacturing uh, decline in manufacturing yeah. output? So, I mean, carbon capture and storage is it's a very interesting case in point. It's, it's something we've been talking about since, well, since the 90s and before, and very little has been done. So last week, um, the Canadian government turned on their new plant. But there's a big issue with carbon capture and storage about really who's going to lead the way. Is it going to be the West, or is it going to be India and China? Um, and China, I know, has been doing some really significant work on this. And if, if the Chinese model is successful, if they really get going first, then it could really shape the whole world if their technology is rolled out rather than the West. I don't see any reason why this technology shouldn't take place and why it shouldn't happen, um, given the right government incentives, because physically we know how to do every aspect of it. The problem has been putting it together in a cost-effective way. Your point about whether this will really bring solutions is a much more profound and difficult question to answer. So carbon capture and storage we immediately have significant losses, so between 20 and 45% are the normal figures of our efficiency losses of electricity generation with CCS added. Um, there can be figures far above and far below this range. That doesn't matter if carbon capture and storage works, if we can capture all of those and we can bury them in a safe way under the sea. But it does start to matter if we start to look at the life cycle chain of our emissions. So, some people are putting fairly high figures on the actual amount of methane emitted during coal and gas and extraction. So these clearly are not captured in the carbon capture and storage. And if we're increasing the amount of coal we need per unit of energy by up to 45%, maybe even more, then we're increasing the amount of methane emitted from the coal harvesting. And so we, we might soon always get to a kind of a balancing point. So we have to be very sure that we understand the life cycle emissions not just look at what's going on in the actual power sector itself. Okay. So, uh, coming to the final question, what were your views on the sustainability dialogue and would you like this to develop into a series of dialogues with the end goal of formulating a robust policy framework for investments in the clean energy sector? So, 
I, I'm a really strong believer in talking, so I spend my life largely sitting at a desk, head down, working. And it's through talking that I actually get most of my best ideas. And also, that's where change happens. So I may come up with some brilliant research, but it does no good if I don't talk to you about it. But equally, I might come up with some brilliant research which is asking or answering the wrong question. And it's by talking that I can really learn what matters to individuals, whether they're civil society organisations, government, industry, all of, they all have different stakeholders, all have their really important questions, which people, academics, people like me, can then go away and answer. And vice versa, they may think that a certain issue is really important to them, but through my research, I may be able to demonstrate, actually, you don't have to worry about so much. So it's a, often the example would be someone's really worried about sustainability. They don't want to take a measure which is sustainable because of the additional cost that will bring. But I can do some, some calculations, some modeling to show sometimes those can actually be a cost benefit or very little impact on the bottom line. So these kind of dialogues are really important for actually making progress happen. My greatest fear is that we just have a series of isolated talking shops. So it's very easy to talk the talk. It's very easy to make academic work which shows how the world could all be made in a better place and more sustainable. But that doesn't do any good unless we actually engage with policymakers and we actually engage with industry and we actually engage with individuals who are the people who are both polluting and are the sources of solving those pollution issues. So dialogue is essential and I think this, is, this kind of model is a really interesting one. Coming together for a few hours talking on a very specific issue but in an informal setting so a wide range of views can come in. So I would really be excited if this session carried on and we could actually take this forward and, and hopefully generate some good policies, some good research and some actual results on the ground. Well, Dr. Kathleen thank you so much for joining us. Really interesting and thank you very much for the whole event.